Watch out. I'm getting ready to step on some of your old stuff. Let them talk the fire out of it. And you say, well, let me pray for it in the name of Jesus. Huh? What? What does that mean? Well, you're a Christian and I'm a Christian. I choose to use that name because he said anything I ask in that name, he will do that the Father may be glorified. But we've so been indoctrinated that, that Grandma can say, well, I'll talk the fire out of it. No, Grandma, let me cast the fire out of it in Jesus' name. So don't tell me the devil's not trying to rob that name. That's the only name will make him tap out. Make him check out of your home and out of your mind. And he says, anything you ask, John 16, 23. And in that day you will ask me, and literally, no question, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. There's another one. Now, he's talking about his name. Well, I sure hope you're right, preacher. <laughs> this Bible's writer than the mail, man. Well, I don't know. He's never done it for me. Have you truly asked him? Because if you're not careful, con condemnation will keep you from using the name. And then we get in this other, this is another religious saying, well, God knows my heart. Oh, my God. So we think we don't have to say anything. Well, God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. It's like I told my wife this past Wednesday night. She said, I'm going to just share my heart. I said, don't share your heart. Share the word. Sometimes your heart can get out of line. Well, God knows our heart. Just remember me. Remember me, will you? Remember you and what? Let me write you a letter. Sing your song. We got this little remember me. I'm, I'm challenging every Christian in this room today. When you at Walmart or the IGA or Piggly Wiggly or wherever you at, and they say, your little buddy says, well, remember me in prayer. So hold on, let me pray right now. What do you need? What do you need right now? I don't care how many there. What do you need? Because I'm going to forget about you. I'm going to get occupied. What do you need? And I need you to tell me what you need. See, I can't pray. You can pray amiss. Well, remember me. I don't know what to remember about you other than you're tall or you're short or you're funny looking, but I don't know what you need. So you stop them right there and I challenge you to say, hey, what do you need? Because we're going to ask it in the name of Jesus that the Father grant to you what you need. So that'll, put, that'll, start, that'll change some things in your atmosphere. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. This is the angel talking to, the, talking to Mary. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and he shall, uh, and shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the most highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will not end. Now Jacob was called Israel. Okay. And he told David, if you remember in the Bible, God told David, David wanted to build God a house. To build God a tabernacle. Because it said David was waxing over in age. And he had seen all of his enemies defeated by the hand of God. And he looked out of his window one day. And saw a little tent where God was dwelling while he was in this castle. And he said how be it that I stay in this nice home. And the presence of the Lord is out in a little tent. I want to build you a sanctuary. I want to build you a tabernacle. I want to build you something great. And the Lord told David he said you can't build it for me. And think about singing David, dancing David, worshiping David, heart on his sleeve kind of guy, David, that he would cry at a song or a commercial. I mean, he just walked with his heart out there before God. And God said, David was a man after my own heart. But he said, David, you can't build this place. But he said, I'll allow your son to build it. And David made a statement to the Lord, well, I want to finance it. What did God would get about financing the kingdom of God? I want to finance it. Can I pay for it? He said, sure. There's an estimated uh, in, in today's currency that uh, I've read bef somewhere before. It was almost $24 billion that David gathered to build this place. Now, some of you thinking about your bass boat and your new truck. and your um, That's not what David thought about. He said, I want you to have the very best that I can do. I want to bring the best to you. But where this statement here is made, he said, upon your throne, David, he said, there will always be a seed 
God goes on to tell David, there will always be a, your seed on your throne. And that seed is Christ Jesus, the anointed one. And this is where he's telling him here that he will always rule over the house of Israel and the throne of David. And his kingdom will be no end. And he tells Mary, he'll, you'll give him a name called Jesus. I challenge you as Christians, if you don't know what else to pray, if you would just repeat the name of Jesus, you will see darkness flee from your midst. She, he says to her, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Jesus. He will be great. Now, I've heard of theologians and scholars and dumb heads and stupid heads try to, well, Mary had an affair with this one, and Joseph did this. and it, They will do anything to compromise, distort the gospel. Don't you let anybody distort the gospel in your ears. Whether it's television, radio, or your own countrymen that tells you anything other than the truth of this gospel, it is a lie. Amen. And you have to settle, oh, I will not compromise the word of the Lord in my life for anything. This name he keeps talking about, this name Jesus, you see in Acts chapter 3 where Peter and John walked up on a lame man, 40 years old, been lame for 40 years. Some of you know the story. And the man was begging for alms at a gate. And Peter says, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have, I'm going to give it to you. And he says, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. That was it. He didn't fast. He didn't dance. He said, in the name of Jesus, get up, get your stuff together. And it said his legs and bones begin to snap into place. In that name. Now, I can already see I'm going to have to reel you in because some of you still got your little gloomy look on, but I'm going to reel you out of that little place because Jesus is Lord. And before you leave here today, you will see that with your eyes. So you can sit there with your basset hound look if you want, but it's going to shift as the anointing of the Lord begins to work on you. We will hunt eggs. Is it raining? It's raining today, so you can't look for your eggs anyway. We'll get that maybe Monday when it dries off. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And if you go on to read that chapter, he, they come out of Pharisees, Sadducees, the church folks says, hey, why, what, what's going on? Why is this man walking? Not praise the Lord. Not thank you, Jesus. Not hallelujah, a man that's now in his 40s that's been lame since his mother's womb is walking and talking and dancing and running. He can run with it. You know, he can do many things he couldn't do before. And here come the church folks wanting to know, how did you do it? And by what name did you do it? But really they already knew. You ever talk to people, they already know how you did it. They just don't want you to say it anymore. And they jumped down Peter and John and why did you do it? How did you do it? They brought the man in, him standing there, ready to play football, been laying at the gate all of his life. Now he's up, bouncing around, got his baseball bat and glove, wants to have a little fun because he missed a lot of things in his life. And these religious dumbheads come at them, you can't do this because you're taking from us and who we are as the church folks, the big shots, and you're using a name that we don't know anything about because we refuse to use that name and you come along and said in the name of Jesus legs be made whole get up and go home son and it says they brought him before people and asked Peter well we know Peter had a little cussing problem before he got saved we know Peter cut off one of them's ear we know Peter done a lot of things he was up and down Peter was fickle man he was up one down and, and down the next, and Jesus had to keep him. Jesus even looked at him one time and rebuked him like he was a devil. Because Peter said, I'm not going to let you go and do this cross stuff and die. And he says, I rebuke you, Satan. Get thee behind me. Just after telling him, Peter, upon this revelation you had, I'll build my church. And when they asked Peter, Peter said, I'm glad you asked me how I did this because I didn't do it. He said, I used the name, the name you crucified and you killed. 
the name that you mocked and you hated. And we got this man made whole by the name of the Messiah, Jesus, the sent one, the anointed one. And this man stands before you today, not because of anything I did, but because of everything Jesus has done. And I'm testifying to you today, he said, as the things I have seen with my eyes, that I've heard with my ears, Jesus did. And Jesus said to me, he, and I can, I can just see Peter in, in his heart, you know, where the devil says, yeah, but you didn't. Don't think the devil didn't still try a little tricks. So imagine Peter standing before these people and now the devil as he's releasing God's word out of his mouth the devil's throwing darts at his mind says yeah but you denied him and Peter just kept on talking about Jesus. Yeah but you denied him and Peter said I will not waver in that and he begins to tell them about a name and they brought him aside and said we can't deny the man can walk and if we do the mob might come and get us. So it said they brought them in and rebuked them sternly. Now don't you do this again. Think about the society we live in. I've heard it said when Christians say, yeah, well, keep on living, baby. You know, you got these new converts. You got these teenagers and they get around you. Uh, uh, let me watch my tone here. You Christians that's had about two or three years under your belt. And here comes these on fire young people or older people, just born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they get around you and you talk the life out of them. Well, if you keep living long enough, you'll be like me. All that, all that stuff will fade away. Why? Why? Man, I'm 20 years deep into this thing and it's not fading away. It's getting brighter and brighter and brighter and better and gooder and gooder than it's ever been. Does that stop the onslaught of the enemy? No, but I got a name that stops him. Amen. Yeah, but everybody can't be happy about the salvation. Then you're not saved. I have to say you're not saved. You're backslidden. Or your mind and your eyes are on something else besides Jesus. So they use this name, the name the angel told Mary. Mary said, let it be unto me as you have said. She conceived and she bore the Messiah. This name, this name that all society is trying to get out of your hearts, get out of your eyes, get out of your mind. You can talk about any other religion today, but when you go to talking about Jesus Christ and Christianity, man, we, they, they're killing them by the thousands. They're murdering them by the thousands. And it's because the enemy says, if I can bring fear back into the lives of God's people, I will control God's people. Don't you let fear get in your heart. You stand strong knowing that the angels of the Lord will guard you and keep you in times of trouble. Amen. They ask him, by what power and name and whom and how did you raise this man up? And Jesus said, I mean, Peter said, in Jesus, whom you crucified. Who God raised from the dead. This man stands here because of this. So how did this name get such power and such authority that when you mention Jesus' name, it gives life, it gives miracles, it gives joy and abundance. A name that is despised by many across this universe. The name Jesus that's for eons and years tried to be, people's tried to talk it out of it and, and prove him to be a Pharisee and a farce. The way the Roman Empire, they called him a whoremonger and a wine bibber. They called him somebody trying to come against the government and bring an uprising. And he'd done none of these things. They fabricated lies against him. But when you mention this name, dead was raising up and children were getting healed and funerals were being stopped and Lazarus come forth and a woman got her son back and a man got his daughter back that was on her deathbed and a man got to see and a woman with an issue of blood touched him and she was made whole and a man walked up on him that was full of demons and they looked at him and said what do we have to do with you you are Jesus the anointed one you are the Christ and he told him be quiet we're not here to discuss that you need to come out of this man's life and he gave the man his family back and he gave the man his babies back while he was in the caves cutting himself in chain because that name Jesus carries an authority and and today we're going to understand more in depth why. Why? Why is it so powerful? Why is it so important? Why does it carry so much authority? Why is it that everywhere we go the devil tries to take it completely out of the equation? 
And I want to ask you something. If you got beat up every day by a bully and somebody said, well, we're going to his house today, you'd say, well, I'm going home. I won't go to his house. Every time I see him, he beats me up. That's what the devil says about Jesus when it comes to Christians that know how to use that name. Walk in that authority. I don't want to mess with you. You're a bully. Your Messiah beat me. He defeated me. Now, I need those of you that are sleepy. I'm not going to preach another step till you get up or get out. You can't lay down on this one. Who's got some no-dos? We got plenty of rooms. This used to be a hospital. You want a hospital room? Book you one. We can get you in there and get you rested up. But you're going to honor the Word of God today in His presence. That's why we're lacking now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So this name carries a power. This name carries an authority. This name is the name that He gave us to use, to operate in, to talk about. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 in your Bibles. We're going to see something here that is a phenomenon. Glory to God. You want me to tell you why that, that there's not any manifestations of the Spirit of the Lord in most churches? Because we stopped honoring Jesus. We started honoring ourselves. We honor our flesh. Why is it that church... We do everything. We can sit at ball games for two or three hours. We can stand in line for two or three hours. But we come to church out of 168 hours in a week. We come 90 minutes on Sunday, and we think we've done God a favor. And half of us can't stay awake for 10. But if I said NASCAR is giving free tickets, you'd line up a mile long to get in to see somebody run around a track and race and wreck, and you'd say, wow, I got to go to the Darlington racetrack. And it didn't add one cubic or one ounce to your life. Well, this is why the enemy brings a slumber into the church because he wants you to null asleep and not get the Word of God down in your heart. So when you leave here today and an onslaught hits your house, the NASCAR is not going to help you. It won't. It won't. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 who being in the form of God did not consider the robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming into the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Who exalted him? Amen. Highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, watch out, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven, in earth, and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what that tells me? All these want to be, should have been, could have been, when that day comes, they're going to be saying the same thing I say. He's Lord. He's King. He's the Messiah. Now it says Jesus emptied himself. And he brought himself down to a level of man. Now, was Jesus half man, half God? No, he was all man and all God. But it said he emptied himself. And people say, well, he was Jesus the reason he healed people. No, it says here he emptied himself of his royalty. He emptied himself of the things that he had with the Father. You see, in order for Jesus to perform miracles, he had to be filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. He done not one miracle until John the Baptist baptized him and the Holy Ghost came upon him. He went into the wilderness, was tempted for 40 days, and he come out, and it said he come out with great power on him. 
The Bible goes on to say that he grew in the wisdom of the Lord. As he grew, he grew in understanding of the Lord. See, because he had to come just, become just like you and me. He had to know what you feel like, what you walk like, what you talk like. And he disrobed all of his royal mantle and come and took upon himself the form of a human being and wrapped himself in flesh. John chapter 1 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it says when he emptied himself of everything he knew before, that was his relationship with the Father. That was the walking with the Holy Spirit in fullness. And it says Jesus learned obedience through suffering. The Bible says. So when people come at him and attacked him and attacked his ministry and attacked his character, he learned how to be obedient and faithful to the call of God on his life through the things that were trying to pull him out of the call of God on his life. We see this in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will, but your will be done. So his will at that point was out of alignment. He had to pull it into alignment with the Father, like some of us need to do today. We have to pull our will into alignment. Because I'm going to tell you, some of you thinking about Stevie and little Ray Ray and all them, they're not going to help you. They will be here when you get out of church, but they're not going to help you. They're going to take your money, they're going to live in your apartment, and they're going to dump you when you lose your job. So what I'm introducing you to is a king that will say, I will supply more than enough for you. I will give you a Abundance of love, abundance of character, abundance of all you need. John 10.10 10 says the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you think he shows up with a pitchfork in your room with a long red tail? He's not going to do that. It says he comes as an angel of light. He comes real subtle and sneaky. He uses people and he uses format. He uses CNN and CBS and things to interject your mind, to pull you away. He uses great, 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 great grandmama's remedy of doing this and saying that. But I found that when I get down to the good old facts of the Bible that it changes me a lot more than anything anybody else has tried to do in my life. Do you hear me, church? So this name is a name that we have to pay honor to because he did something that I believe some of us don't grasp the fullness of what Jesus did. When he emptied himself he separated. He left heaven and came to be with us. He got in the ditch with us, people. He got down in the mud and the mire and the sin that we were in to get us out. Who could have done that? Muhammad, Buddha, Harry Krishna? No. No. Could Mama? Could daddy? No. No, they can't. Mom and daddy can't get you out of what you're in. But Jesus can. He can. Jesus can put it back. He can make you whole again. Why is it that it's the number one place the devil wants to keep you from? Church. I love it when pastors and I hear people talk, we had a great day at church. I said, yeah, man, what happened? Well, who got saved? Nobody. Who got healed? Nobody. Who got baptized in the Holy Ghost? Not anybody. We had a great song and some cookies and Kool-Aid. And they all passed out free uh, $10 gift cards to Texas Roadhouse or wherever, Applebee's. We got the fellowship. And by the way, I met a new fellow at church. He looked good. He had a couple tattoos, had some muscles on him. He was looking good. And I really thought he was nice. No word. No Jesus. Just self. Just self. Let me tell you where self will get you. Dead. Lost. I'm just checking your temperature. Come on. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So if he emptied himself, how did all this happen? How did he empty himself? What did he do that maybe we overlook? What has he done for us? See, because we've seen these little pendants on our neck. Well, Jesus, 
Jesus is not on that pendant. We got so many cleats. We got the little things hanging in our home. First Corinthians, chapter, the book of love. Why your family lives like vampires and hate each other. Hmm? Mouth filthier than a sailor, but we got four or five First Corinthians, chapter 13, verses quoted around our house. That makes us feel better. We love each other. When the people come to visit, you love each other. But when they leave, you don't speak for another week. Hmm? <laughs> mm. So what did Jesus do? Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And I'm just kind of wading into this. I, I don't have no set agenda with this. I spent six hours before the Lord yesterday. Six hours. Now, I'm not saying that as a wow factor. Because I was really asking God, what in the world? I want to I wanna talk with you. I want to be with you. I need to visit with you. I want to sup with you. Man, I need you to just give, me, give it to me. Let me have I don't care if I'm walking down the high. If he slays me and I lay across the yellow line, don't pick me up. Leave me laying there. I want to get what's mine. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, just talk about Jesus. I said, yeah, I need a little more. He said, what more do you need? I said, well, nothing, Lord, that's good. that's good enough. Your name, he said, my name does it all. My name will do it all, son. Huh? It'll do it all. I said, well, Lord, that's what we're going to do. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, uh, a multitude, heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Now we take just that right there, and we use it at Christmas. And we get three wise men, a couple of fake donkeys, and camels. Then we get our kids to stand up and sing, which is wonderful. But uh, who said there was three wise men? Huh? Jesus, we, uh, will, you give, will you just afford me to just kind of wade into this a little bit today? I mean, it's 1130. You okay? You hungry? You all right? You have your biscuit and gravy and stuff? Did you get everything you needed this morning? Some of you need a shot of coffee, I think. See, your flesh will start thinking about everything. You know, hurry up and get this over with. I want to go. I, I, I hunted Easter eggs yesterday. I want to eat the eggs now. <laughs> How many know we have a personal angel? The Bible says you have an angel assigned to you. How many know this was Jesus' personal angel? He come and he began to tell them the Savior's coming. He's born in Bethlehem, the city of David. What did he tell David? Upon your throne, there will be no end. And he tells him to go to Bethlehem. You're going to find the Savior of the world. Now, that is a bold statement. But now, when it's coming from an angel out of heaven, I, I tend to want to believe it. Okay? That would kind of make me want to believe it. And he begins to give them something that for Thousands of years at this time had not ever been done. Think about it. Adam forfeited our birthright in the Garden of Eden. The Holy Spirit left, the presence of the Lord left mankind's life. 
From then until now, mankind has not been indwelled by the Holy Spirit to the fullness. Now, the Bible says the Holy Spirit would come upon men that was doing services for the Lord, and God would come upon them, and he would use them mightily. But there was no indwelling like Adam originally started with. Now, the angels come in there, and, they say, and he says, Behold, the, the Savior of the world is coming. And all of a sudden, angels burst on the scene, and they're standing side by side, and they're singing, Praise be unto God, because they have never never heard this announcement for several thousand, a couple thousand years. They had not heard this before. Because how many know the Father has all things and he releases it at his own will. He released this out and when the angels heard Jesus angel pronounce that the Messiah has been born, they were sitting there with the wings of flapping and just couldn't be still and burst on the scene and said, glory to God, goodwill is coming to men finally. Finally, daddy gets his family back because somebody's there that can get the job done and he will not forfeit to his flesh. Hosanna in the highest, they would sing. And Jesus was born in a manger and we want to say he was broke and he was pitiful and mom and daddy had a nickel and couldn't get in the motel room and the Best Western wouldn't let them in. But that is an absolute lie. It was Passover time. The city was packed. The hotels was full. They come in on a donkey and they had to stay at the inn because everything was packed up. You ever had that happen to you and you had to drive another town over just to get a room? This is what happened to Jesus and Joseph and Mary. And it says, and three wise men brought them, him a Tonka truck and an apple and a banana, and said, be blessed. That is not what happened. The Bible says frankincense, myrrh, and gold. When you do the study on it, uh, as much as 10 to 20 wise men came, which they were called magi, which was kings, and they'd bring up to 10 to 100 camels with them to present the gold and frankincense and myrrh. Jesus at his birth had plenty of dough. He just could do whatever he wanted to do with it but we don't take time to study the Bible because the enemy has taken Jesus and he wants to keep him on a poor place he wants to keep him on a low place he wants to keep him in your mind where you don't believe anymore that this name is above all names and this name is greater than anything you've ever come in contact with so the devil uses propaganda and religion and grandma stuff and granddaddy stuff and some of our stuff and he mixes it together and we bring Jesus down to a low ball and we hope that one day we can make it to heaven I'm not hoping I'm going to make it the day I said Jesus come into my life I knew right then and there that I had made a difference in my life and I was going to serve him until I draw my last breath on this earth and I, in front of Jesus, and said, glory to God, I made it. I mean, that's what I'm looking forward to. He said he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Not to walk around being afraid of that. Well, we don't know. Yeah, anybody got a cane? We'll, we'll just get that little walk about us. Man, when I started reading the Bible for myself, I stayed mad for a couple, three years because I said, them, lying, them people's lied to me. These preachers lied to me. So I, I get excited. Well, you want to keep it calm and keep it between here, son. Don't get outside that box. Well, that's just the problem. I wasn't born again in that box. I was born again in the kingdom. I was, the Bible says he took me out of the kingdom of darkness and placed me in the kingdom of his dear son. So that's not a box. That's a kingdom. That means I got to start living like a king. Right? And the devil's always trying to rob that from you, steal that from you. So these angels begin to sing. They announced that he's here. They announced that he's here. It stunned the earth. This announcement threw hell into a panic. Think about it. The devil's trying to figure out what's going on because the Bible said he did not know for sure. He did not know exactly when Jesus died if it was the right man. And here's hell in a panic because angels jumped up on the scene and said, the Messiah is being born in Bethlehem. And see, immediately the devil started his stuff and went and talked with a jealous king and he went out to kill him. Did he not? 
And God would always orchestrate this thing. Move the child. Move the baby here. Man, I like that about the Holy Ghost. Move when you got to move and stay put when you got to stay put. But the Holy Ghost will tell you that kind of stuff. Man will always say it don't look good, don't sound right, don't go to bed. You say, well, hold on a minute. Let me ask the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost says, stay put. Don't you listen to any of them. So hell was in a panic. The angels were singing. They announced that the serpent crushing seed has been born to Mary in Bethlehem. There's about to be a showdown. There's about to be a throwdown like this world has never seen. And the devil was taking excedrin and he was giving all his de demons uh, red bull drinks to keep their energy level up because it was about to get rough for them. What kind of man is this that is being born that can crush me? See, this is what the devil says about you. You can't win. You can't succeed. You can't be great. You don't have a purpose. You'll always be sick. You'll always be broke. You'll never get the promotion. And that's lies. Absolute lies. And we believe that junk, and it gets in our, in our subconscious. So this has never happened before. The angels was excited. Jesus was being born. The Passover lamb had come to Bethlehem. The house of bread was here for all of us to partake of. The Bible says in Mark chapter 11, it says they begin to sing as he come into town. Hosanna in the highest. He comes in the name of the Lord. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see ye your king comes to you righteous and gentle and riding on a donkey. But I want to know what he did. I want to know what made his name great. And I don't mean he built a business or he even just built one church. Jesus started, sealed, created the church of the living God. All the lambs came from the fields in Bethlehem, which was about five miles from Jerusalem. Now we see where the high priest would be waiting to inspect the lambs. Because they would send them out to bring their lamb in out of these fields. And they had to pick a lamb that was no spot, no blemish. And they would put them on their shoulders. And this is what was going on in this particular passage. They were walking back into the city. And they had the lambs on their shoulders holding their feet. And here come Jesus in the middle of the bunch. And they begin to say, there's the lamb of God that takes away the sin in the world. And he walks in. Isn't it funny how everything lined right up with the times? God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes. So they come in. They hold a Passover meal. But here's where I want to get started. After this meal, and Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant that causes the promises of Abraham to stand. This is what he was saying. What you're partaking of here and what's about to take place will cause the promise, the covenant between Abraham to come upon your life. Now, if you'll go with me, we're going to follow Jesus here for a second. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus leads them by the light of a Passover moon. He usually relaxed here, but tonight was going to be a different night. The Messiah, the one that raised the dead and opened blind eyes, cured issues of blood, paid taxes, fed 5,000. He's walking back with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane where he would usually sit back, listen to them chatter like children, and he would watch and he'd occasionally interject some wisdom and knowledge. Now, those of you that don't understand who Jesus is or you don't have a relationship with him, this may not mean anything to you at this point, but before this service is over, it will hit you between the eyes. He goes to the garden. The Bible says he wrestles hell that night. He's all alone. He wages a battle on his knees while toning demons awaits him. An avalanche of sin hits him. Physical pain, shame, guilt, abuse, rape, slander. These demons begin to hit his body. They begin to hit his mind. And it says he would get up and he'd come back and he found the disciples sleeping. He said, could you not watch with me? How many know when you're in a tough spot you want somebody just to talk to you? 
See, this is showing where he emptied himself. I mean, if he, was all, if he had not emptied himself of all of his royalty, this would not bother him. He had to become like me and you to know what it felt like. And the demons come at him with everything. And think about it. Now Satan said, I couldn't touch him for 33 years. And all of a sudden, I'm able to begin to infiltrate. The Bible says that we were made righteous, but he was made sin. How did he take sin in him? By believing the Father and by faith, he allowed it to happen. And he's on his knees. And the Bible says as he prayed that he prayed so anguishly that drops of blood became to come out of his forehead. He knows lonely. He faced that for 40 days in the desert. So he's been lonely before. And he conquered it. But tonight's different. Tonight's totally a place he's never faced before. Our royal king was terrified. He could not die here where the first Adam died. And death was trying to do so. Death was trying to keep him from going to the cross. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. And cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. Not only did Jesus die for sin, but he died for the curses that sin brings. So those of us that have been born again and saved from sin, but still accepting the curses of anger, curses of jealousy, curses of sickness, diabetes, heart problems, joint pain, that is a curse somewhere that you have to receive. Jesus died and took the curse for me. Not just sin. If it was just for sin, he did not have to die on the tree. He could have died anywhere, but he didn't. And he's here asking his disciples to pray with him, be with him. And he's fighting death. Satan's last opportunity to destroy the announced seed. He had to die on a cross. Redemption to come to Adam's fallen race. He said, Abba, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, thou will be done. And it said, the Bible says an angel come and strengthen him. He was so tired so wavering that the Bible says an angel of the Lord came and gave him strength. I'm going to tell you in the middle of your midnight hour when everybody else has walked out, when you call upon the name of Jesus, there will be strength. There will be things that will come upon you. And that's why the Bible says they'll look at you and say, how are you doing it? How do you make it? Everything is falling down around you, and yet you have a joy and a radiance and a presentation about you that nobody else is carrying because you believe this name, Jesus. Now we know that next he was arrested. He's taken to the house of the high priest. Mark chapter 14, 55, chief priest saw a testimony against him. Here comes the liars. Verse 57 says, some rose and bore up false witness. They made up lies. Said he's a blasphemer. He said that he was greater than Herod. And they started making up lies about him. How many's ever been there? The more you do for Jesus, the more lies is going to come. The more you operate in God's anointing, the more lies are going to come. The more people is going to critique you and say, well, you're supposed to be. Let me, this here, you supposed to be a Christian? You know, when you, when you finally stand up for yourself and say, hey, that's not, that's not right. You can't do it. You, whoa, 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 whoa. This stops here. This stops here. And then they'll, you're supposed to be a Christian. So you get to slap me, cuss me, steal from me, talk about me, come get my lawnmower when you want to, and I'm never saying, no, that ain't how it works. You're going to stop it. This stops today. You're not adding to my life. You're taking out of my life. I want somebody around me to add to me. Well, you're supposed to be a Christian. And then that's when you can say, yeah, but you're supposed to be one too. Mm. Well, I never thought about that. Gee, I could have had a V8. <laughs> if you're in love with Jesus, you look for the love place. You look for the place to love. Because he says love will cover this thing, and there's a love walk, and it causes faith to work. I'm not, you know, but the steady, we got this mentality, the more we get trampled on, the more known we That's not true. You stand up for what you believe in this Bible. And don't you allow the devil to run over you with any of it. So they rose up and bore false witness. And the Bible says the lambs had to be inspected for four days. The lambs they brought in where they were singing Hosanna in the highs. They inspected them for four days. 
Now think about it. Jesus inspected first by the Pharisees and the high priest that night. They slapped him in the mouth. They called him names. They'd ask him questions, but when he'd speak, they'd hit him. They mocked him. There were people lying against him. People they paid. This is where Peter denies him. This is where he fails to honor the Lord out of fear. So they inspected him all night. Pilate checked him out the next day. Pilate sent him to Herod. Then he sent him back to Pilate. And the Bible says Pilate washed his hands. Front of him, it says that his blood's not on my hands. And the Israelites said, let it be on us. Let his blood be on us. We'll stand for it. Now, after this point, Jesus was carried to what they call a carnifax serum, a flesh nailer. They called him a flesh nailer. They stripped him naked, forced him to face a stone or a column, tied his hands on the other side. So his back would be stretched good and wide. And the beating begins. Finally, when it stops, there's blood everywhere. The onlookers are gasping at the sight that they see. Because for some reason, they beat this man more than they did normally. They had beat him with a cat of nine tails that had stones and glass and steel and sharp objects in it. And when they'd swing it around his back, it was tearing the flesh out of his back. And blood was gushing out. The Bible goes on to say you could see his internal organs in some places. So he's bleeding. His eyes are swollen from the fist that had been hitting him. His beard had been yanked out. Then they put a robe on him, mocking him. The idea that he said he's David's seed and that he knows Abraham. So they put a robe on him, mocking him, saying, if you're a king, he's a king. Bloody back, swollen face, eyes shut. Then they get thorns and they put in his head, almost three inches long. They shove down in the Messiah's head and blood began to gush out of his brow and his forehead. By now, I'm sure he had very little strength of any. He's been stripped and beaten, mocked. He goes through another round of spitting and punching and toning before the robe is ripped off. Now a wooden beam on this hot, humid air day, flies flying around, insects swarming the blood, dogs howling and trying to get a lick at him. They make him tie, and they tie this beam to him to carry the cross. Now the lamb is being led to the slaughter. He falls from the loss of blood and his injuries and dehydration. He can't carry the beam. He's too weak. His body is beginning to go in shock. And he walks by his mother. That could not recognize her son that she raised. Now I don't know exactly how Mary felt. But if your son. Was tied and beaten like a dog. Not even a dog. Till you did not recognize the man you raised. Imagine her heart when he was tied and carried this beam. And here he comes down a cobblestone street, blood dripping all off of him. They're still beating his back, mocking him. People are trying to get to him to flog him. And he never opens his mouth. But I couldn't help yesterday but think when he walked by mama. Did she go back to when she was just a teenage girl when the angel said, Mary, you have found favor among women. And you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And of this name, there will be none like him. He is a king. 
Will you accept this honor, Mary? And she said, let it be unto me as you have spoken. Now, I can hardly say that a mama, after seeing what she saw, might have said, Lord, I never intended to see this. My son has been destroyed. She was the first one, if you remember, when they were at the festival, the wedding, and, then, and she said, do what he tells you. And he turns the water into wine. And he even questioned mama and said, what are you doing, woman? She said, you tell us all the time, just do what he says. It's going to be all right. So the little boy that helped daddy build tables and chairs and ran and played is now carrying a beam unrecognizable by his own mother and they're carrying him up a hill. I want you to see this picture because the Bible says he humbled himself. He humbled himself before God. He climbs Golgotha, and they drive five-inch spikes in his hands and feet. And they drop this post in a hole, and they hang him there. Blood rushing everywhere. What little bit is left in his body? Now, what you're going to see is why his name is great. Because there had other people been crucified but not like this man. Never had this taken place like what they see in today. Six hours he hangs, nailed. At the third hour, which was 9 a.m., he speaks his first words. Luke 23, 34 records it for us. It says, Father, forgive them. The man's beaten, torn, tattered. His first words is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Second, he speaks to a thief. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. He saved others. They would yell. Let him save himself if he's the Christ. One thief was cursing him and mocking him. While the other looked at him, and asked for his mercy and acknowledged him. And while Jesus was almost before death itself, turned to him and said, you will be with me today. Today. Today is your day to make a decision. Not tomorrow. Not yesterday. Today. Today. They were getting to cuss him and scream. Even while in pain, he answered this prayer of the thief. His third words, John 19, 26 and 27, he looks at mama. He says, woman, behold thy son. And he told him, John, behold thy mother. Years earlier, he had gave a widow woman back her son, but he could not, he must not, give this woman back her son because it would alter eternity. Mark 15, 34 records, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Before the veil could be torn in the temple, the heavenly curtain must fall between the Father and the Son. The Father must turn away from the Son and creation knows it very well. The Bible says at the sixth hour to the ninth, which was 12 noon to 3 o'clock, darkness fell over the whole land like midnight. And in his final words, closing in on his death, he said, it is finished. John 19, 30. He said, it is finished. There will be no more sacrificial systems. 
He completed all the types and shadows of the Old Testament. No more do you bring lambs and goats to the slaughter because I am the sacrificial lamb. And the curtain in the veil ripped open and revealed the Holy of Holies. And one of the Hebrew things is when a father lost his firstborn son, he would cut his robe all the way up to his thigh as a signal that I've lost him and he was mourning. And when this curtain ripped open, it revealed the father like nobody had never seen before in their life. This is what put Jerusalem in a fit because all the Jews knew nobody was to look upon the glory and the presence of God. But all the while he's saying, my son caused that to happen. Jesus allowed you back to me. Without Jesus, you would never see me again. And when that curtain fell down, every bit of them started running and scared. What is going on? Because before that, if they went in and didn't keep themselves right, when they poured the blood on the mercy seat of God and before him, they could drop dead in the presence of the Lord. Now God does something he never done before when he revealed himself. Jesus said it's finished. Now I don't want you to think he was holding his head down in a soft manner either. He yelled. He yelled. Don't a lion roar? Don't he lo and he roared. He said it's finished with all that he had. And they could hear. And here's what happened. The trumpets would blow. The shofar was blowing. because, And this is why he knew. Because when the sacrificial system was over with and they've offered all the lambs, the priests would climb up on the tops of the temple and they would blow the shofar. And Jesus heard this in his ears. And he said it is finished. No more will you have to do that. I'm telling you why his name's great. Luke 23, 46 says that Jesus made the statement, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I trust you, Abba. I surrender myself to death's icy embrace. I'm trusting you not to leave me in his grasp. And Mark 15, 37 says he cried with a loud voice. And he breathed his last, and he yielded up his spirit. This is called full trust. He says, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Because the next phase, folks, was hell. He had to go to hell. He was innocent, and this is the devil's downfall. He took an innocent man. He killed an innocent man. And God allowed that dummy to lure him right down into his domain. Sinless. Spotless. Humbled. Beaten. But yet royalty. King of the ages. But yet became a servant. He didn't die for him. He died for us. He died for you and me. And he bowed his head and geared this up. And when he went into hell, this is where the showdown happened like no other. This is where the devil had a bad, bad day. Hmm. You see in Hebrews chapter 1, you can see through, uh, 3 through 9, where he says, I have begotten him again. He is my son. Let every angel worship him. This was the words the Father spoke, and every angel, every demon, everything that was created by God bowed its knee to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Doing this, he, he made us new creatures, new creation. 2 Timothy 1, 10, it says, Who abolished death. Colossians 1, 13, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and gave us life. Colossians 2.15, he said he spoiled principalities and powers and made an open show of them. Now, this is what happened in hell. 
Because when they used to take the kings and capture the city, the king would take the king of that particular city and march him down the middle of the street so all the people could see, I now own this kingdom. This is what Jesus made Satan do in the corridors of hell. Every demon and every principality that was down in this domain had to watch Satan walk right in front of them to show his authority. And he says, now you bow your knee and you give me back the keys of the kingdom so I can give them to my sons and daughters. You are no longer their master. You are no longer going to beat them. You are no longer going to enslave them another day in their life. All they have to do is call upon the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Will you give me 10 minutes? John chapter 20, I need you to see this. John chapter 20. This is what's going on here. John chapter 20. I want you to see this. Remember, that's why his name is great. Verse 15. Said Jesus said to her, Let's back up to verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was laid. Then they said to her, Woman, why are thou weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And who are you seeking? She, supposing him to be a gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said, Rabbonian, which meant teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And she left and went to the disciples. Now verse 20. Nineteen. Then the same day, verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, which is Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said again, Peace to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. Now look, look closely. 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. There's your salvation. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, this woman comes to him and he said, don't touch me, for I've not yet ascended to my Father. What was he saying? He's conquered hell. He's rose from the dead. He's seen in the garden. And he says, don't touch me. Now, why is that important? Because the high priest had to be washed. They were washed by all the other priests before they went into that holy of holies. When they were bringing the blood before God and the mercy seat. And when they'd go in, they'd pour out the blood, and then he would come out, and this would be a symbol that the sins of the people are forgiven for one year. Their crops will grow. Their herds will be fruitful. Things will happen for them. And this was a sacrificial system that God instituted when he brought Moses in the Egypt, out of Egypt that he put in to protect the Abrahamic blessing. We've turned the law into something bad, but the law was there to protect the Abrahamic covenant. 
and he would pour this blood out as a sacrifice. Now, Jesus has come out of hell, defeated everything, but it wasn't over. He went to the throne. The angels gathered up his blood. He carried his blood. Now, I want you to see this because the Bible says he carried his blood and poured it out on the mercy seat of God. Let me give you scriptures. <laughs> Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9, let's look at 21. No, verse 7. Hebrews 9, 7. Thank you for your patience. But into the second part, the high priest went along once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people and the sins committed in their ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest holies of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It is a symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifice were offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. Concerned only with food, drinks, various washings, fleshy ordinance imposed until the time of reformation. You still with me? But Christ came, verse 11, as a high priest of a good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats or calves, but with, the, but with his own blood, verse 12, he entered the most holy place once and for all having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifers sprinkling uh, the unclean sacrifices for the purifying of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason he is a mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Look at verse 21. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. Now what he's talking about there when he had Moses formed the tabernacle. It has its use tent, the brazen labor, the brazen altar, the candlesticks, the bread. The enemy had taunted and tainted this. And it says that he come in and cleansed the utensils, uh, verse 22, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven, where was it at? In heaven, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered the holy place made with hands. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are the copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the presence of God for who? Amen. Glory to God. So he's appearing for us. So here's what he did. He gathered up all his blood. He walked into the Father. Keep in mind. Been separate. First time stepping back in to his rightful place. First time ascending to where he descended from. Carries his blood, pours it on the mercy seat in heaven, which down here was types and shadows. And it's the first time the angels saw the Father look around and be satisfied. And when he done that, now, now, the sacrifice was complete. He says, now go get them. And now you see the same day, same chapter, when you get to verse 27, you see where he says, touch me, feel me. He stayed all day. When we, what, what, what we first see, where did he see Mary? That morning. He says, do not touch me, for I have not ascended to my Father. Jesus ascended into the heavens. He went into the house of God. He went into the throne of God. He stayed all day long. 
He poured his blood out. He talked to the Father. He came back. And when he come now, the sacrifice was complete. He said, put your fingers in the holes. Touch my side. And it says now he breathed on them. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. You're now back to where you should have been to start with. Then you see 50 days later to Pentecost. See, God didn't rush this thing. Now, here's what he showed me yesterday. The Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from man when the Garden of Eden, and he could not dwell in man, which God created him to dwell in us and be with us and lead us. Now, when Jesus came and breathed on them, salvation took place. But when you get to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, And that there will be a power that shall come upon you. Yeah. Two different places, right? Exactly. Two different things. Wouldn't you agree? And he said, so here, look at this, look at this. The Holy Spirit had to wait. Why? Because God says every type, every shadow, every jot, every tittle will be fulfilled in my word. Fifty days later, fulfilled the first Pentecost. When they come out of Egypt, 50 days, and he met them at Mount Sinai. That was the first Pentecost. Now here he is, 50 days. He comes in like a mighty rushing wind, and it says, there goes cussing Peter again, stood up and began to preach the gospel when that power had come upon him for service. So here's what you got to ask yourself. How 